So cool. So welcome everybody. Glad everybody may have been. Uh, we're going to get started today and we're going to talk about uh, palettes. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some different ways to record them, what the different types of palettes are, some different functionalities and uses for them. And then we're going to also shift a little bit back into the programmer and talk about how fame changes works and how to do time only palettes. Uh, and that's kind of bridges into the start of kind of busking. How do you run a show live? So that's what we're going to cover today. Uh, I do want to kind of give a couple of house rules. So there's a chat and there's a Q&A. So once again, the Q&A is for uh, if you have a question for us specifically, we'll try to glance over and answer them as we go. There will be a dedicated Q&A at the end. So about uh, in an hour or so, we'll have a dedicated Q&A and we'll try to answer your, any questions that I got you know, left behind or uh, any questions you have at the end. Uh, we also are also doing little swag boxes now. So uh, if you do ask a question, you'll get randomly selected at the end. Uh, and a random uh, person who asked a question in the Q&A, uh, we will be able to reach out to you and uh, send you a swag box after, of course, we get back into the office and we can send out a swag box to you. Um, so, yeah, Megan, do you have anything more to add before we kind of get started yeah. with our outline? Yeah, just, what, uh, just one thing. Can you all make sure to mute your mics just in case everyone should be muted already? But just to be safe, let's just all mute if mute just so that there's no like feedback or anything fun like that again everyone should be muted i think we set those permissions correctly but just making sure <laughs> that they are um what's in the swag box someone's asking before we get started it's a surprise it's like a surprise. it's a swag <laughs> box you'll just you'll find out when it gets you when and like noah said we have to wait till we get back in the office to actually send them out so we, we could even change it up tomorrow. We could, we don't, we're just going to throw some swag in. Yeah, you'll just, you'll just be included. Uh, we'll reach out to you via email uh, if you are randomly selected. Cool. All right. So with that being said, let's, let's hop right in. Um, like we said, we're going to cover palettes today. So the most important thing is to, like, how do you, how do you record a palette? I know we kind of at the end of the last week's video is we kind of discussed the basics of recording a palette. So like, let's repeat those steps, dive into it a bit more. Um, Noah, go ahead and open your group directory and the visualizer. All right. So when you're making palettes, you want to select the fixtures that you want to apply them to. So we're going to go ahead and start with the spot 2000s um, and let's turn on that highlight function. So again, highlight is just going to allow is going to allow us to to turn the fixtures on without actually specifying at full. Um, it's only turning on the fixtures that we have selected on to open white. Um, so if we wanted to record a position palette where they're tilted downstage a bit and fanned out, we're going to go ahead and do that. And now to record this as a palette, it's as simple as pressing record, because that's what you want to do. And then you tap on the kind key or to open that directory. So he hit position and that opened that position directory. And then he taps where he wants it to live. So to go ahead and just click on one of the squares. And that recorded it as that position. Now, if you wanted to name the palette after recording, because it being position 51, we don't really know what it is. Um, you can press the set button immediately after recording. And that's going to pop open a dialog box for you to just give it a name. So he could call it like fanned out or fan out or um, I like to put the put the fixtures that I used. If it's a specific palette like this, so I do one through nine. That way I know exactly what they are. Um, or if it's easy to type the, the user number. Cool. And now if and so that's really how you record the palette. Um, it's. Pretty, pretty much as simple as that. So let's do a, let's do one more palette, a beam palette actually with them zoomed all the way down. So we'll just go ahead with these fixtures still, um, hit the beam button a couple times to get to zoom. And then we're gonna zoom them all the way down to 0%. And now to record this as a beam palette, we hit record, tap on beam, and then tap on one of the cells where we want it to live in. If you notice in the beam directory, we uh, there were a couple beams already recorded. That's because of those auto palette functions that we had. Um, why they're open, go through and have all the different gobo names because those that's when we hit auto palettes. 
Um, again, we can give it a name if we wanted to. So if Noah presses set, uh, because we did something, it's not going to open that quick name box. So because we did something in between, we can hold down set and then press on the palette, and that's going to give us a name to the naming box. Um, great, and that's zoomed in all the way. And then let's record one more palette, and let's do a, col a color palette. So the reason why we're, and before we record the color palette, the reason why I'm putting them in all these separate directories is because each directory has its own default masking. So like the position directory only wants to store position information. The beam directory only wants to store beam information. The color directory only wants to store color information. And there's one more the, that we're going to really talk about today, and that's the intensity directory. And that by default only wants to store intensity information. So each directory only wants to store that proper information. So, uh, like I said, we're going to store a rec record a color palette right now. Um, so let's go ahead and make these guys orange for me, Noah. And the reason why we're choosing orange is because auto palettes does not make us an orange color. Cool. These look pretty pretty good orange. So now to record this as a color palette, we're going to hit record, tap on color, and then click where we want it to store in the color palette in the color directory. Press set and then give it a name. I totally did not spell that right. <laughs> it's okay, because you can open the color directory and I wanted to point something out. So if Noah wants to go back and re-spell that, right, he can hold down set and click on the box and rename it if he wants to. That's up to his organization right now. Live typing is the worst. There we go. Cool. There we go. And now you might notice that the other color directory, the other color palettes have a color to them. To assign that color, we can right click on the palette inside the directory and then choose a color. Um, if the color you're looking for does not exist, you can always go into custom and change the color to whatever you want it to be also. Um, and it can you can get as precise as you want to there. Once you have the color chosen, you hit the enter button, and that's what it chooses. There's also an auto function too. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Go ahead and keep going. You just you got stole it from you. That's okay. Go for it. So there's also an auto uh, function, so you can hit auto, and it will um, automatically use the hue and saturation or the CMY values to um, auto generate that uh, palette. So what if you have a palette that has multiple colors in it? So like maybe the orange and the blue, it's gonna choose whichever was the most predominant color. So if I had, you know, four fixtures that were blue in that palette and five fixtures that were orange, it's gonna pick the orange because that's the more predominant color. Cool. And that's what I had on the basics of how to record, how to record palettes, how to customize a little bit of your palette naming and colors um, and colorizing your directories once you have them recorded. So remember to record, just reiterating the syntax to record a palette, you select your fixtures, put them in the values that you want, press record, and then tap in the right directory where you want it to be stored. There are ways to make palettes with the, um, there are ways to make palettes that have different fix, different types of parameters in it. So like I said, color only wants to store color, but if you wanted to store like I red, I green, I blue, you could make that happen. Um, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later in the day. I mean, a little bit later in this video, um, it is possible to make to record other parameters inside a palette if you wanted to. Before I hand it over to updating palettes, uh, Charbel asked, "Does the does the auto color work with color wheels?" No, it does not. It only takes the hue and sat values or the CMY values, depending on how you color mix. So it's based off color mixes, not on color wheels. And with that being said, Noah's going to talk about updating palettes and making some of these palettes a little bit better. Yeah, so there's a couple of ways to update a palette. Uh, so the joke, of course, is there's more than one way to skin a hog. Uh, so there's more than one way to do just about anything, and updating palettes is definitely one of them. So let's take a look at that uh, position palette that we recorded a second ago, that fan out palette. Kind of scroll down a little bit. Uh, I'll press clear. Let's take a look at it. So I'm going to say one, three, nine enter uh, and then I'm gonna put them in that palette and it actually you know it looks it looks pretty good uh, now this information is actually added into the programmer 
Okay, so as I select those fixtures and I apply that palette, it is in the programmer. So if I adjust the pan and tilt values of uh, the fixtures right now, you'll see that it no longer displays that palette name. So we've now given direct hard values to these fixtures. Uh, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna adjust it a little bit, maybe condense it just a little and maybe do a, I'll do a center fan, center fan. And we'll call that as our, say, our fan out palette. So there's a couple of ways to take the information that I've just created in my programmer and then put it into that palette. So the first way is I just, I hit record and then I touch on that palette. I can also type in um, uh, record position 51. So if you like the, the command line syntax, you could also do that as well. Um, and when you do that, there's a couple of options. So you have your record options, you have insert, merge, replace, and then cancel. Uh, anytime that you record to something that already exists, you're gonna get these options. So uh, insert, what it does is it, is it actually creates palette to the next, to the right of the existing palette. So maybe I fat fingered it and I wanted to create a whole new palette. You can hit insert and it's gonna create palette 52. This is we're in 51 currently. Then there's also merge and replace. So what merge does is it takes the information in my uh, programmer and it adds it in on top of the information already in that palette. So it's going to update anything that was already there and then also add in anything extra. And then you have replace. So what replace will do is it basically just deletes everything in the palette first and then adds in the information from your programmer. So if I had uh, position values for other fixtures in this palette and I were to hit replace right now, uh, it is going to delete all the other stuff and only put in the information of what's actually in the programmer window at this time. Uh, you can also, instead of hitting uh, record, so I'm going to cancel out of that. You can also just hit the merge key. So the merge key is just to the left of the record key. And you could just hit merge and then choose that palette directly. So I will click on 51 and then that window doesn't come up. So a lot of times if I know I just want to merge the values, in, I'll just hit merge and pop it right into the palette. So this is the first way to update a palette. You take the information you want, you put it in your programmer, store it or record merge it into an existing location. The other thing that you can do is you can open that palette. So after I recorded that palette, do keep in mind that the information is still in my programmer. So I'm gonna press clear. It's gonna clear out my programmer. And what I'm gonna do this time is I'm going to open the palette instead. Um, I'm also gonna switch this over so you guys can see kind of what's happening on the front panel. So I'm gonna hold down open, hold down. Once again, if you're on Hogcore PC, you can hold the key down by holding shift if you're using the virtual panel. And I'm gonna touch on that palette. Something pretty important came off, uh, happened whenever I did this though, and that's the blind key. So anytime that you open what's called an active editor, which is um, either opening a queue or a palette, um, or even the program itself is called an active editor, uh, the blind key comes on by default. And what that basically says is it blinds, uh, it prevents output from that palette. So if I were to uh, uncheck blind, my fixtures are actually listening to that information right now. Uh, they're not on, uh, and so if I turn on highlight again, so if I press the highlight key, which is conveniently right next to blind, I can now actually see the fixtures in this palette. Uh, and then from there, I can edit the palette really easily. So maybe that uh, middle fixture, if I select picture number five, uh, it is highlighted right now because that's the only fixture selected. Maybe I wanted that to be somewhere else. So maybe I wanted it to be, you know, maybe a little more focused on our lead vocal singer. If you look in the, uh, this window right now, you'll see that there's a dark blue value. So that tells you what I have actually modified and adjusted. And then at the top of this window, it also actually does say you know, in asterisk it says modified. So that lets me know that I have made some sort of a change. And then what I can do is I can either close this window and it's gonna say, do you wanna update it? Uh, or I can just press the update key, which is just to the left of merge and record. And what that'll do is that'll close that window for me automatically and make that change. So what's the kind of pro and con of using uh, the record and putting it into the palette versus opening it up is with the command I just entered, the information that I put in was not also added to my programmer. It was just put into that palette. So sometimes depending on what you're doing, you might want to keep the information in your programmer. And sometimes you just want to open up that palette, make the adjustment, and then not have that information in your programmer. So let's just take a look at it and make sure it works. So one through nine, go ahead and tell us to go to full. And I'll select that palette. 
And then you can see that that kind of middle light is kind of aiming down a little bit. So I did successfully update this palette. Um, so there are a couple other things to, to kind of mention about this. So uh, like Megan said earlier, the each directory by default only takes in information relevant to that directory. So the position directory normally only takes in position values, color directory only takes in color values, et cetera, et cetera. And you can know what information is stored in your palettes. Uh, if you look in the directory, there will be like a little letter at the top right corner, and that'll basically tell you the information that's in that palette. So in this uh, position 51, I can see there's position values in this um, directory. So I can go ahead and add in uh, values other than position. So uh, let's go ahead and reopen that palette. So I'm gonna press clear. So I don't have anything in my programmer while I'm doing this. I'm gonna open up that palette once again. I'm going to uncheck blind and turn on highlight so I can see my fixtures. What's nice about this too is it selects all your fixtures in your palette. Uh, so you don't have to like select them as you open it. And let's say that I want them, my fixtures to be zoomed in. So this is really handy. I can go with the beam. Glad you made this earlier, Megan. And I'll sit, put my fixtures in that zoomed in palette. Now, something that a lot of people don't get at first is that when you press update right now, it actually doesn't take those beam values. Okay. That's because the, the palette has not been told to uh, take information other than position. So if you look at the top of this window here, there's an I, P, C, B, E, and T. So that's information that is uh, called uh, associated with the mask. So I for intensity, position for, or P for position, C for color. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable B for beam. And that's going to uh, include the beam information that I have added into this palette. So once again, I'll press the update key. Now, if you look in this little palette, it actually does have a P and a B in it. So I know I have position values and I have beam values. There's also a little R here, which we'll talk about actually in a little while, but that's called a reference palette. So once again, let's test it. One through nine, at full. Put it in that palette and boom, there you go. We went to that position and we applied that beam value. So sometimes you need a specific thing that also happened when you go to a position, uh, like framing shutters, zoom and focus, gobos, et cetera, et cetera. All right. I'm just gonna take a quick look at the Q and A and then we'll kind of move on to our next topic. Um, Megan, did you see anything in the Q and A in the world? Um. Nick just asked something. Is there a way to select all fixtures in the palette? So, for example, when a palette is made for a specific fixture set. Yes, you remember how that works. There's a way to do it. Um, so normally when you open a palette, it selects the fixtures automatically for you. Um, there's a way to do it. I can't remember. There's a way, so you can do live. So if I like put my fixtures in this palette uh, and then I say, you know, fixture number five, say do something completely different, uh, you can do what's called live. So you press the live key, which is in the top left corner of the console, and then you can select that palette. And then that will choose uh, any fixtures that are currently getting their information from that palette. So that's kind of one way to do it. Yeah. So either if you don't have any fix, if it's a, so in your, you can either open the palette and close the palette and that'll select it or select the fixtures that are already in the palette, but are live on stage live. And then that button, like Noah said. Uh, so Medina asked, is there a, is there a plan to make an all palette like in a, um, so once again, we're not a major MA programmers, uh, actually hardly any at all. Uh, so I'm assuming what an all palette is, is probably a global palette in our terms, basically a, a palette that can be applied to all fixtures. Uh, and that is something that we're going to talk about in actually just a few moments. We're going to talk about the different types of palettes, which um, there's global, there's per fixture, there's per type. And then there's also a couple other um, that don't fit into that category. You've got like reference palettes and direct palettes. So we're going to talk about different types of palettes. Um, but once again, you know, why are palettes useful? They're useful for a couple of things. The big thing is uh, they get you places faster. Uh, and then the other thing is their references. So, you know, if I took my fixtures, I'm gonna close these windows real quickly. So if I said, you know, all solo spots and I put them in, say, the drummer position, and I hit it full, 
that's referenced. So if I have multiple cues that are referencing that position, and then of course the drummer moves six feet downstage, I only have to update that palette instead of having to update scenes or cues or anything like that. So that's the big advantage of using palettes. Also, you know, color palettes, you want your fixtures to kind of match a little closer in color and different values and things like that. So get you places faster and uh, references. So they're your building blocks for your show, really. Um, I'll answer one more of these. So Chris says, uh, when you make scenes that refer to palettes during the show, uh, he makes an adjustment and he presses update, then the update dialog always opens and update scene is defaulted. When I do this, does the info of the palette get overridden? Uh, no. So if you wanted to, if you were opening a scene or a queue and then you made some adjustments and you updated it there, you do have the option of, do you want to update the palette? which would update other cues and scenes, or do you just want to update this item specifically? So by default, it assumes you just want the cue uh, or scene that you're editing or you're updating. Cool. Uh, I'm going to mark this as okay, um, real quick. How do you change the palette title from a colored outline to a solid color? Didn't miss it. I just didn't cover it. Um, inside the directory, the you can click on the little check mark bar, check box icon, and then to click. Make sure you check the box that says color code entire button, and that will change it from an outline to colored. I love the color button because I can't see outlines, but I can see a full colored button. No problem. Um, something else that's really cool in those options, if in the, like the color directory, um, there's an auto color swatch. And what that'll do is, we're about to see it happen. Once you check that box, hit OK. It actually puts a little like pill shape into the box um, so that you can, if you don't right click and give it a color on uh, automatically, then you can actually see what the color is without it having a color, like a fill that you choose. So it's a, and again, that's based off the hue and saturation or the CMY, the color mix values. And I, I use that if I do like a color palette that has like two colors in it, I'll do auto color and then, or sorry, that um, I'm trying to say the um, auto color swatch. And then I will take the actual outline color and make it the other color that's in my palette. So if I had like a purple and an amber uh, color palette that was going you know, back and forth, I'll let it auto whichever color it picks and then the, whichever color it didn't pick or the not majority, I'll go in and change that so that I can kind of see how the combinations of the colors work. Um, yeah, and auto palettes will be can be edited the exact same way. They're just palettes at the end of the day. They just get automatically generated for us. You just, you can either open it or merge and update your update exactly in the same methods that Noah just covered. Uh, do keep in mind though groups are not referenced so groups are just for selecting fixtures if you update a group it does not update fixtures into multiple queues or scenes etc cetera, etc cetera. cool um Trevor, before we dive into the types of palettes can, can you demonstrate the dual color coding of the color palette yeah so take the take these colors or take these fixtures um, also, just seems so you can see them a little better here. So uh, let's do a couple of colors. Let's do like what I said, right? So we'll say magenta, and then I'll say select even, and I'll say orange. There you go. That's pretty. Uh, and I'm going to record, and I'll put it. You know, we'll put it here, right? So if you look in here, it assumes purple because purple was the majority. I have five pictures that are uh, this purple magenta color. And then four fixtures that are orange. So it assumed that you wanted um, the purple color. And then I can go into uh, the right click here. So let me actually uh, show you the right monitor. It brings up a sub window that doesn't get captured by the video recording software. And I can say orange. And so now I can see that in this palette, I've got purple and orange values. And I can use that to my advantage to kind of say, oh, there's these two colors in here. 
Uh, you can also just simply label it. So a lot of times if I do like a red, white, and blue palette, I'll just go red slash white slash blue. And that's usually enough for me to know what it is. I know it's not red, white, and blue, but you know, something I do. Cool. And we're gonna keep go. So with that said, we're gonna keep going. Um, if we didn't get to your question, there is a dedicated Q and A that we're probably saving it for. Um. Cool. So now that we've talked about a little bit of recording and updating palettes, uh, we're going to go over some of the specificities of palettes. So, uh, and the different types of palettes. So when I say specificity of palettes, I mean different. So like a color palette is generally going to be a global palette. You have different. It's going to be generally a global palette. So that means it's going to apply to any fixture that has that parameter value. Then you have like a per type, which means it's only going to work with that per type value. And then you have uh, with that per type with that same fixture type. And then per fixture means it's going to only apply to the fixtures you have selected. Uh, these are all options that you can specify as you're recording your palette. So let's, so whenever, so sorry guys. So we're going to open up that co orange color palette that we recorded earlier. So Noah's going to hold down open and then click on that color palette 51 and it opened up that global color palette. Um, and you can see that's global because it says global all in there. That means it's going to apply to any fixture that has those parameters. So as long as the fixture can control hue and saturation, then we're going to apply those values to it. And that's what global means. Uh, so let's go. Ahead. So as long. So how do you record a global uh, palette? As long as the fixtures all have the same value and you're not recording into position or intensity palette, uh, directories, it will try to record as a global palette. Um, so go ahead and close this guy for me, Noah, and let's just record one more color palette for this. So hit clear. And let's do um, the RGB bars in the back. So 401 through enter, great. Um, and then make them any kind of color. Let's do green. Cool. Green's a terrible color, but just for the sake of it. Yeah, it, it works enough. It'll show what we're trying to do here. So again, to record this, we'd hit record. And now after you tap record, you'll see your soft keys change at the bottom of your screen. And you can see where it says global per type or per fixture. Because we're going to record in the color directory, it's going to record but global by default. So if Noah taps in the 54 palette now, oh, we're doing global. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Yeah. And now it's going, you can, and then if we open it up, hold on, open tap on it, it's going to say that it applies to all fixtures at this time. Cool. Um, so that's how that's how we can record global palettes. Uh, and if you're trying to record a global position palette, then you'll need to make sure you specify and hit that global button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, cool. So the next type of palette and the next one down is your per type. So the per type palette means that this this uh, value that we have in our programmer is only going to work for this one specific fixture type. Uh, so let's hit clear. And let's see this with the wash 2Ks. Um, so 101 through enter. Cool. And let's put them in a purple color with hue and saturation. Oh, we can barely see it. Oh, we can see, it. yeah, barely, but yeah. there, there you go. There. Awesome. And so now to record this as a per type fixture, we uh, per type palette, we hit record. Press the per type button at the bottom of the screen. And then go ahead and tap on that orange mix. And we're going to update this palette this way. Um, and we're going to push the merge to get the information in to the same palette. Cool. And now let's see how this, let's go ahead and open the palette real quick so we can take a look at the inside. And you can see that we still have our global value specified. And then our wash 2Ks are now going to listen to a different value. Um, and that's how it looks inside the editor. So we can close the editor. And then to apply this to 
like the and then we're going to apply this to the spot the same palette to the spot in the wash 2ks at the same time so 1 through 9 plus 101 through enter and then click on that orange mix for me and we can see that the spot 2ks are in orange whereas the wash 2ks are in purple because of that um, global and then per type spec uh, specifying And now there's one more way to be specific, and that is the per fixture. And what that's going to say is for this one fixture that we have selected, we're going to apply that value. So let's hit clear. Let's say when we apply that orange mix, we want fixture number five to be green. So let's hit five at full. And then make it green for me. And then go ahead and hit record. At the bottom of your screen, hit per fixture because we're specifying the per fixture type or the per fixture palette. Yep. Click on it and hit merge. Great. And now when we select those same fixtures, 1 through 9 and 101 through 118. Sorry, I broke my model. Um, so we're going to select 1 through 9 and 101 through 118 at full. Put them in that palette. And you can see that the wash 2Ks are in our purple that we said per type. The spot 2Ks are listed to the global value, and that one specific fixture, fixture number 5, is listening to that green mix. And now if we wanted to see that inside the editor, inside the palette editor, we can hold down open and tap on that one color palette. And we can see that fixture number five is being more specific to say to these other hue and saturation values. So your global, so how it's kind of ranked is your global values at the bottom. And then we look for any per type values. And then finally, what wins at the very top is the per fixture value. So if you have a per fixture value, that's gonna win over every other type of value inside your palette. And just a little bit about recording these guys is if you are, so when you're recording palettes, uh, like I said, the position palette, if you record inside the position directory or the intensity directory, those are gonna be recorded as per fixture palettes. Um, that just makes it really, those, so knowing, the, knowing that can make it, can help you speed up and decide where you wanna put information. So if you wanted to, just apply what you're doing to the spot 2Ks. If you just go to the, the position directory and store that info there, it's going to only work with the fixtures you have selected. Um, if all fixtures have the same parameter values, then the palette is recorded as global. So as long as you're not recording to that position or intensity directories and they all have the same values, we're going to record that as a global palette. And then finally, if any parameter values are different, then the palette is recorded as a per fixture palette. So if I have a color fan going across and I record that as a color palette, it's going to be recorded as a per fixture palette. And with that, and that's really how the global per type and per fixture works. So yeah, so we'll look at the Q and A really quickly, and then we'll talk about a couple different palettes. Um, let's see, let's see. So if I knock out the, if, if you knock out the per fixture value, does it take over the global info by default? It'll go to the next thing. So if there's a per type that works for it instead of a per fixture, then it'll go there. And if it, if there's not a per type, then it goes to global. So Brian asks a great question. Can palettes reference other palettes of the same type, i.e. upstage left and upstage right being referenced and updated by a palette called upstage? Uh, so yes, yeah, so that's called reference palettes. Uh, it's actually the next thing we're going to be talking about. Uh, so that can be done. Um, uh, someone said it's strange that it turned green. Uh, and that is actually, uh, it, it actually kind of makes sense when we think about it. Uh, so the reason why it turned green is because it actually looks at the um, per fixture values. It's counting how many fixtures follow it. Well, in that orange mix palette that we recorded, we actually did supply 
uh, per fixture value, and that was green. So that's why that auto generation looked at that because that's a specific for that fixture. Because if you think about it, it doesn't actually know if there's actually any things of that type or, or, or all value that can be applied. So that's why you can always override it. You know, so if you wanted to call it, you know, purple or whatever, you can do that in um, the color directory as well. Yeah, it's going to look for the most specific value to do, to do that with. Uh, because if you notice, as we did the per per type, it also then colored purple because that was the most specific value. Um, how to update a global palette. Uh, so you actually are going to have to merge the value in. Uh, so what I usually do is just select one fixture and then merge it into a palette that's already been recorded globally. Otherwise, it's going to assume that you want a um, per fixture palette if you opened it up. All right, so uh, the next thing we're going to talk about uh, is we're going to talk about um, reference palettes and we're going to talk about direct palettes. Okay, so these are how those palettes are applied. So the first we're going to talk about is a reference palette. So I'm going to go ahead and close these windows here. And we'll take a look at what a reference palette actually looks like. So if you know that you have a reference palette, is there's a little R in the bottom left corner, excuse me, of that um, palette. <coughs> excuse me. So an example that I made in this show file is there's a couple of band palettes. So there's band one, two, three, four, uh, and there's also a backlight palette. So let's just take a look at what they look like. So I'm gonna take my fixtures, two full, one through nine, cool. And then we will apply the first band palette. And just so we can kind of see it a little better, I'm gonna zoom out a little tired, just so we can see kind of where the beams are going. Um, so here's one band palette, here's another, right? We're just highlighting different members of the band, different positions. Uh, what's cool about this is this is actually a reference palette. So what these palettes are actually looking at is these palettes over here. So these positions 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, uh, so those uh, band palettes are using the information in these other palettes first. So let's take a look at these palettes. So I've got one that all lights aim at the electric, keyboardist, lead, drummer, and the uh, bassist. So if let's say the, you know, like what happens, the, the drummer is now uh, no longer there, he is now uh, somewhere else on stage, we can update this palette here. So I'm gonna open it. So there's a lot of values because there's actually values for all the fixtures to the drummer, uh, but I'll just select fixtures one through nine. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uncheck blind. So just so you can see, uncheck blind and then check highlight so I can see uh, what's happening in this palette. I'm going to reset these position values so I can hold down period and press position. And we're just going to pretend. We're just going to pretend that the drummer is now no longer where he actually is, but he's actually in the middle. So I will switch my fan mode over to normal. And I'm going to fan in my lights. If you don't know how to do this, we actually covered this in the last video, which you can find on the YouTube channel now. There's a YouTube channel with all these videos that we're recording. Uh, and I'm just going to say, you know what? There you go. The drummer is right there. Tilt my lights up just a little bit. We're just going to pretend that he's now mid stage versus being over there, stage left. I will press update again. Now, once again, because I didn't include beam information, the zoom information doesn't get added to this palette, which is really handy. So I updated my uh, uh, fixtures and press clear. And I'll say one through nine at full. Open that drum palette. And you can see now that they no longer aim on the drummer, they now aim towards middle stage. Now what's handy is that if I use any of these band palettes, some of those fixtures, zoom that in again, are now actually getting their information from that updated palette. So it's like palette inception essentially. Uh, let's take it, let's actually open up this palette. So I'm gonna hold down open, touch on it. And you can see that in this palette, it doesn't actually show the values of the uh, pan and tilt values and degrees, it actually shows the palette that it's getting its information from. So I know that fixture number one is getting its information from the keyboardist palette, then electric, lead, drums, lead, keys, lead, bass, and drums. So I can use that information to kind of um, take some smaller palettes to update larger palettes. 
Uh, this is also handy for more than just like positions. So I a lot of times use this for um, focus points. So a lot of times I'll have you know a picture that has gobos, and we'll have say seven gobos on this first wheel. And what I will do is I might not know what the focal point is. I want my pictures to be sharp to the gobo. So what I will do is in each of the gobo palettes, I will have a reference palette to a focus palette that uh, has the focal point for the first gobo wheel. That way I don't have to update every single palette with updated focal information. I just have to update the one uh, bean palette that has that focus information in it. And then it trickles in to uh, the rest of the palettes. Um, so that's just a reference palette. Uh, you know, it's not absolutely essential for your show file, but it's a handy tool that if you have a good use for it, you know, it works out. And close that. Um, the other kind of palette that I wanted to talk about, oh, and, and actually before I saw, talk about how to record it. Uh, so on that record toolbar where we saw a uh, global per fixture per type, there is also a value for include references. So I'll just select some pictures and we'll say, um, all of y'all go to the lead palette, and then I'll say, select my even fixtures, and y'all go to the air up palette. I might want to have that as a reference. So if I hit record, and then on my toolbar here, there is an option for allow refs. There you go. There you are. Uh, so that is not enabled by default. So you do have to, if you want to allow references, you do have to enable it. And then I will pick a position in my position directory. Now, if I were to open it, you can see that every other fixture is either following the lead palette or my air up palette. So if I update those, it will update that palette as well. Just a handy tool. Uh, John says, you know, he wasn't here for week one. Can you provide a link to the base file? So if when you registered for the class, there should be an email that reminds you of the class uh, that's coming or the webinar is coming. Uh, you can download, there's a little link, you can download all the show file and the visualizer file there for free. Uh, you should also get a follow-up email after the webinar is closed, and it should also have the same link. Uh, if you can't find it, just shoot me an email, noah.allen at highend.com, and I can get that for you. I also just answered that question with the link okay, awesome. from Study Hall. These links can also be found on Study Hall. Um, so, yeah. Cool. So the other kind of palette that I want to talk about is a direct palette. So a direct palette breaks references. So uh, a direct palette, if you take your fixtures and you apply that palette and you record it into a queue or uh, so record it into a reference file or anything like that, it doesn't actually hold that reference to that item. It means that if you update that item, it doesn't update other items. So reference palettes are good for a couple of things. Uh, there's uh, some that are in the show file by default when you generate auto palettes, and that's in the intensity directory. So I'll double tap intensity. And you'll see that at the bottom of each of these, there's a little D. That means that it's a direct palette. Uh, so let's take a look at what, the, what happens in the programmer. So I'm going to say 1 through 9 at full, and I'll say 90% palette. Uh, now, it actually does say 90% as the value. Uh, but if I were to record a palette, so I'm going to say record this is intensity 31. Let's take a look at the difference here. So I'm going to say uh, 1 through 9, enter, tell these fixtures to go 90%. And then once again, I'll select my even fixtures and tell them to go to that intensity 31. And if you look in the programmer here, you'll see that some fixtures are listening to a 90% value. That's the actual hard value. Uh, and others are actually listening to the palettes. It means that if I update this palette here, uh, and I you know, tone it down to say 40, and I press update, if you look at the fixtures, uh, they will actually have uh, different values. Now, uh, kind of hard to see there in the visualizer, but they are actually at different values. Um, so they are at different values. Let's open that up real quick. Let's turn this really, really down. Zero. And now, number nine, enter, 90%. And then this intensity 31 is actually a zero value. So I will say these fixtures go to 90. 
select my even fixtures again, tuck with that value. So once again, these fixtures are direct. They are going to that value and they are not referenced. Whereas the other fixtures, if you update that palette, it's going to update it in your cues and scenes and things like that. Uh, it's also good for positions. A lot of times I'll do a direct palette for like a home position. I don't want to include that home position as a reference. So I might say one through nine, tell fixtures go to full. And I'll just put a zero, zero value in my programmer. So zero degrees of pan, zero degrees of tilt. And I'll say record position. Uh, and while I'm here, like it can actually showcase a global value. So I'm going to say record as global. And we're also going to say record as direct. And we'll just put it here in our position directory. Now what's handy about this palette is that if I select, say, uh, any fixtures, it doesn't reference, once again, uh, but also because it's a global palette, which we talked about earlier. So if I selected, say, the UNOs, and I tilted them something else other than zero, it goes works for all fixture types that can have a zero zero value. So that's a direct palette and reference palettes, just a little handy tool uh, that's available in the console. Uh, if you ever want to do the opposite of a palette, you can hit uh, fixtures at. So if I wanted to uh, use a palette but not include that reference into my programmer, so if I said one through nine at full, and I say uh, at say quad fam. Uh, if you look at my programmer, it has the hard values, whereas if I didn't hit at on my command line, so if I just select my fixtures and I just applied it, it now uses that palette reference. So if you want to do the opposite of a palette, you can say uh, fixture selected and then at the value, and it'll do the opposite of whether or not it's a direct palette or not. Uh, just looking through the Q&A really quickly. Uh, so once again, on the study hall, there is a link to the YouTube channel as well. Um, I might be able to bring that up briefly at the end. Let's see here. Are default palettes direct palettes or reference palettes by default? Um, I'm assuming by default palettes, you mean auto palettes? The auto palettes in the intensity directory are direct. The rest are reference palettes. Um, so again, the intensity palettes are direct when you use auto palettes, and the rest are reference palettes. Well, no, there are no, there are no reference palettes by default. No, not unless you change it in your preferences. Sorry, my bad. There are no reference palettes by default. They're just not direct palettes. So uh, here we are on the study hall website, guys, uh, which is where most of our social media is being directed. Uh, so this is where you can find about future webinars that are coming up. Uh, so we'll get next week's on there pretty soon. But at the very top, it says, did you miss a live event? Visit our study hall channel. And that'll take you to a YouTube page where you can view uh, the various videos that have already been recorded. So you can find our uh, previous videos right here. We also have a couple that are in other languages as well. So if you speak uh, French or German, uh, we have a couple that are working on in other languages. All right. So, uh, Megan, you want to take it over with uh, yeah. kind of masks and stuff? Yeah. So, we're going to go ahead and talk about recording other parameters, talk a bit more about recording other parameters inside a palette. Um, so, we've mainly been recording with like position and parameters inside the position directory, color parameters inside the color directory. But the, uh, but the, there are ways to get like position and beam into one palette. That's usually when I use it, whenever I want to go bow in this one specific focus in this one specific location. Um, and to do that, you do that with like the kinds and kind of masking. So let's go ahead and try that out real quick. And let's do an example and I'll explain as we do the example. So let's hit one through nine at full. Go ahead and tilt them down stage a little bit. And put a gobo in them. So we're going to record a position palette with position and beam. Um, so we want this gobo and we want this position in here. 
So when you hit after you hit record to record the palette, you can see that there's a button here called kind mask. When you click on that kind mask button, it's going to bring up the different kinds and parameters that you can mask into this palette. So basically you're selecting what parameters do you want to include in this palette? Um, and once you start start selecting here, you have to select all the parameters that you want. So we want position pa position parameters and beam parameters in this case. So we're going to hit position and beam. And then you click in the directory where you want them stored. So go ahead and click in one of the position palettes. And now you can see that we recorded inside this position directory, the position and beam. And you can see inside the programmer that we're referencing that palette specifically, that position 46 palette for both the gobo and for uh, pan and tilt. Um, so again, that's using kind masking. So after you press record, if that kind mask that button doesn't automatically come up, you just hit the kind mask button at the bottom of the screen, and then you can select what parameters you want. Yeah, so on the smaller consoles like the Hedgehog, this is not this does not show up automatically. You can enable it in your preferences window under, under programming or miscellaneous. There's uh, there's an option to show that uh, by default. But if you're on a smaller console, it doesn't show up by default. Trying to save real estate a little bit there. Um, you can also uh, before you press record specify what what kind of kind masking you want. No, can you just hit undo a couple times? Um, cool. And oh, that's too many times. That's okay. Uh, one turn on it's full. Sorry. No, it's fine. I just wanted to undo the record. Tilt them down stage a bit oh. and put a gobo in. I could have been more specific. It's okay. Cool. So we have this gobo in, we have it positioned. So now if we wanted to record position and beam without hitting that kind mask box. Um, you want to specify before you hit record. So we're going to hit position and beam, the kind keys themselves on the front panel, and then hit record, and then tap on the position in the position directory where you want this stored. So now you can see that you have that, it's the exact same palette with the little P and little B. We just were able to hit the buttons instead of pressing on the screen. So those kind keys can be used to prep, can be used to actually um, specify before actually recording. Now, those are just some of the, those are just the default kind keys, those fixed kind keys. They are the intensity, position, color, beam, and effects. We also, inside HOG, have the option to do auto kinds. So let's go ahead and hold on open and tap on fixtures and open that fixture window. Set up patch. Yeah, or set up patch. <laughs> I, I like open fixtures. Um. And now hit, and up at the top there, and right next to auto palettes, there's an auto kind button. And when you click that, it's going to make a whole bunch of other user kinds for you. And now if you press, so can you undo the record real quick? Again. I think that'll also get rid of our kinds. Do what? Yeah, that gets rid of our kinds as well. Oh, that's right. It does. Okay, cool. So now that's undone. Let's go back in and show where it is again. So in the fixture window, up at the top of the screen, there is an auto kind button because we hit undo a couple times. It undid it. Um, now we're going to press auto kind and that should make our kinds come back. We can see what kinds we have um, in a couple different spots. If you're on hog4 PC or on a console that has kind keys with a, uh, user kinds and commands with a screen, and you're in kind mode, you can see what they are right there uh, on your front panel, or you can actually go into the kind directory. So if you hold down open, at the bottom of your screen, there's a kinds button and you can hit those kinds. And now you can see that we have a whole other, we have a whole lot more of kinds made. Um, so what basically happened when you hit auto kinds is we went through each fixture type and broke, broke it up. So now you should have one specifically for color mixing, You'll have some for framing, the different color wheels, the different gobo wheels, zoom, focus, that kind of thing. So we just broke up the different types of parameters that you have even more outside of the intensity, position, color, and beam options. And so what that means we can do is even be more specific with our kind recording. 
in recording what we what exactly we want inside our palettes. Um, so if we wanted to do just a focus palette, we can do that. Uh, go ahead and close the kinds window. Uh, so one through nine at full. Uh, go ahead and tilt down stage a little bit so we can see it a little bit better. And then hit beam and put a gobo in. And then let's adjust our focus a bit. Kind of hard to see, so I'm going to zoom yep. it out just a little bit. That's okay, because we're only going to record focus in this one palette. <laughs> so before, when we were recording beam palettes, we would just hit record and then beam, and it would grab all this beam information, the gobos, the zoom that Noah just did so that it looked better on the visualizer and the focus. So what we can do since we used auto kinds is actually just record the focus into this one beam palette. Um, so hit record for me. And we're going to go ahead and just record it into the position directory because we can with this um, and then click on the focus one. Now. You can see that our kind masking box got bigger because we hit that auto kinds button and then now click where you want it inside your inside your position directory. And now you can see that position 61 only has beam information. So now you can open that directory, that palette up, and you can see we only stored the focus information. We didn't grab any other kind of beam information in there. Uh, so this is just really useful to help dwindle down exactly and make palettes exactly for that type of parameter specifically. Uh, I do this with some reference palettes and gobos. So all my gobos reference that one focus palette. Uh, so that there, if I just need to adjust the focus, I go to that one palette instead of adjusting all eight gobos on that gobo wheel. Noah, you had a you have a suggestion here that you like to do with an on and off palette. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah. So a lot of times I'll be in a directory and I want to turn fixtures on or off specifically. Uh, so I can use that kind of masking in other directories. So like. For example, the intensity directory, I, you know, if you're only using zero and full or, you know, really only a couple of intensity values, you don't need this always open. It takes up room on your screen. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll say one through nine at full, uh, and I'm going to say record. I'm going to hit global. The reason I'm going to hit global is because I want this to be applied to any fixtures that I have selected, not just fixtures that I have selected with solo spots. So I want it to be um, anything that Uno's, the washes, the LED bars, anything that's in this uh, file to work with this palette. Then we'll say intensity. And I'll report it into my position directory, say here. And I'll do the same thing for at zero. So I'll say at zero. Once again, I'll hit record, global, select intensity, and put it into, say, position 60. Uh, and now what that means is that if I select these fixtures, oops, one through nine, enter. One through nine, enter. Uh, and if I say put them in a position and then I select over here, I don't have to tell the fixtures to go to full. So if I'm already using my touch screen or kind of in that window directly, if I have something I'm going to need a lot, like at full or at zero, I can just mask in that information into that directory. Uh, and once again, I did make that global. So if I had selected some different fixtures, say the Unos, uh, 301 through enter, put them into palette right here. Boom, there you go. I've told the fixtures to go to full. So if I touch on the screen and then touch there, I've made that change. It just saves me a couple seconds here and there um, for typing if I'm already you know, touching things. Cool. Um, and a little bit in that Q, so I'm looking in the Q&A. Um, someone, uh, Sonia asked, do I recommend selecting auto user kinds when patching so it offers all the user kinds? Most definitely for exactly what we just did, for exactly what we just did here. Um, with like just recording that focus, I usually do press that auto user kinds. That way, I can get more more masking into my palettes if I need to. Um, again, I do a lot of media server programming, so being able to just say, "Hey, I want that media folder and that media file, and not all the keystoning and stuff that's in here right now." That's really important to me. Um, and then also for like if I'm wanting to separate my gobo from my framing shutters, for example, um, that's another time that I use my masking a lot. Yeah, and, and you can make your own user kind. We're going to talk about that in the 10th video of the series. 
Uh, so you can make your own parameters and include them into uh, when you record. So I'll do like the theater kind is what I call it, or the gobo kind, where it includes gobo one, gobo two, but as well as focus and zoom information. Uh, and sometimes like iris and frost, anything that kind of deals with like what the image of a gobo might look like. So that way it includes all the information. And I don't have to go pick and choose each one automatically. I just doop, the image kind, or sometimes I call it the WYSIWYG kind, what you see is what you get. I call it something different every show, but it's another example of a grouping of parameters that I use a lot, and I'll just record that as my own user kind. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to talk about that in more depth in another video. Yeah. Um, let's see. I had a, there was one, a couple in here that I wanted to answer as well. Uh, Josh has a really good question. He says, "Hi, if I reference the focus kind in the programmer." And I changed my mind and want to undo. Is there a way to do this without losing the gobo? Just want to remove the focus kind. Uh, so there's a few things there. Um, and kind of looking at how you kind of want to translate this. Uh, if you have a palette, let's say that we did like we were talking about earlier, where you had a bunch of gobo palettes and they're all referencing a single focus palette. If you delete that focus palette, uh, it is going to keep the information in the other palettes. Uh, but it's just going to, instead of having a reference, it's going to basically put in that hard value. So if you delete that palette, it won't remove that information from the palettes, but it does break that reference. So then there's a few things you can do there. You can go into the palettes, and then if you hold down um, backspace and press beam, that would remove all beam information. You could also select the uh, values. So let's, I'll do it in the programmer. It's the same uh, concept. Uh, one through nine, four. Uh, so let's say you had focus information in the programmer. Uh, you can select that information from the palette, and if you hold pig and press backspace, it'll remove that information. And then you just update the palette after that to uh, remove that information. But as I said, if, if uh, a palette is recorded and it is referenced in other places, and then you delete that palette, it does not completely remove that information. You do have to go back and remove it. Uh, it just puts a hard value there instead, which might be to your advantage. Um, Medina asked, how can I change the short list of kind mask for palettes? Usually the kind masks only show the basic intensity, position, color, beam effects, and time. So those are because those are the fixed kind keys. Those are always going to be there. Um, if you want the expanded kind mask box, like what we had on the, like what we did to just record the focus, that's when you go into your fixture window and you tap on auto kind and that'll expand it. Or you can make your own custom kinds without going into auto kind. Um, as Noah said, we're going to cover that a bit more in the last stream that we have planned or the last of the series that we have planned. Um, but there are, so my, the best tip I can give is right off the bat. What I do is when I launch my show file, get everything patched in, I hit that auto kinds button and just let the console make those kinds for me. So, uh, it's Yido. Keto asks, if you use the on-off palettes um, from what I mentioned earlier, will that intensity be recorded into the queue? Uh, so yeah, by default, a queue or a scene, kind of a playback item, uh, it's going to want to include all information. But what you can do is if you record and you know you have that information in your programmer, you could record, hit add all, which is on that kind masking toolbar. Uh, so I'll flash it really quickly. Uh, you can say at all and then deselect intensity and that's going to include up. Oh no. Not put it into the next thing that you record, which is good if you want to keep a fixture at full, but not record it. Um, William asked, how do I add kinds if we want specific kinds added and not everything in the auto kinds? So that's where you can go in and record your own kinds in the kinds directory. Um, you hold that open, talk on the kind, hit record, press on the kind you want in the kind directory. I'm just going over this because like I said, we're going to do it and then you, and we're going to do it more in depth in another video. And then you can drag the parameter you want to another kind. Whether or not you use these for actually programming, it doesn't matter. Um, this would then allow you to have it in your kind mask box. And if you 
so uh, we're a little behind, so we're going to kind of skip this Q&A section for a bit. We're going to move on to uh, kind of our next topic, uh, and that is uh, time pallets. Uh, so this is uh, something that uh, a lot of people ask about is how do you better handle timing in the console? Uh, and I do want to preface this with uh, the topic of busking. So, you know, our console is designed for busking. It's intended for doing things live, uh, but you do need to kind of have the tools there in place beforehand so that you can really have the best uh, functionality of your show. Uh, there is a function of the console called fade changes, which uh, has in the past by many users been used as a way of running their show. Uh, generally, I don't recommend you do like your entire show with fade changes, uh, just because there are some limitations. Uh, I really recommend that you do your show using playback sources and then modify them there. Uh, but you can, if you're in a pinch, use fade changes to sort of get you out of jail. Uh, so anytime that I punt a show, I usually try to do like 90 to 95 percent of what I'm doing in playback, in a queue, in a scene, on faders, and you know, punching back and forth between things I've recorded. But occasionally something unexpected comes up or that I need specifically, and I'll have to use the programmer to create that item. Um, and we're going to talk about more about playback items in future videos. The next two videos are going to focus on um, cues and scenes. But just in the meantime, we're going to talk about just kind of how can you get stuff um, interesting to happen. Uh, and so the first thing is, I said, fade changes. So uh, this is a thing in the programmer window. So I'm going to open my programmer window. It's not on by default, so you do need to enable it. There's this little fade changes button. Uh, and basically what that means is that anything that I do is going to be applied using fade and delay times. For, so if I say one through nine at full, uh, helps if I show the visualizer, so I'm going to go zero. And if you look, and I say at full, it actually takes two seconds to go from uh, zero to full. So it's fading between those two points versus being instantaneous. Uh, and you can adjust that time value pretty easily. There's a few ways. Uh, if I say time, which is a, a button on the console just to, to the left of the group key, I say five enter. Now what that means is these fixtures are gonna follow a five second fade time. So there's actually a way you can see this. So if I go to the programmer and I hit the fade button, I can see that it's now a five second fade. And now if I say at zero again, it takes five seconds to get from that point to another. Uh, you can do uh, a fan time as well. So I'll do this for positions. So we'll size this over and open up the position directory here. And uh, we'll put it into a palette and tell the fixtures to go to full. And it takes that time to get there. If I switch palettes, so I go to that single cross palette, you'll see that it takes five seconds to get from A to B. Uh, and then you can also uh, have per uh, kind timings as well. So if I said intensity time zero, enter, what that means is that now my intensity values are going to fade over zero seconds, whereas my position values are still going to fade over that five second value. Uh, so this is good for a couple of things. So if I said you know, at zero, I'm doing something, whatever, um, and then I can start, I'm start the fan out thing, and I'll say at full. And you'll see that my pictures have come up. Uh, the intensity was instantaneous, but the position still took time. So this is good if you just kind of know how to use your time values. You can kind of sneak something in, and it's not as harsh and brutal uh, for your show. Uh, you can also do a fanned uh, time on these as well. So these are really fun with, uh, say, color. So I will take my fixtures and put them to full saturation. They're currently a five second saturation because that was a sort of a global time that I specified earlier. I didn't specify a mask before it. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, color time. We'll just say let's do zero. So it's instantaneous. But now uh, I can do a fanned uh, version of that. So I can say color time and I'll say zero through five enter. So what that means is that my first selected fixture is going to have an instantaneous fade and my last fixture is going to have a five second fade. And so what this means, if I change my colors, so go to cyan, you'll see that the color is actually transitioning from left to right a bit. Uh, now that's one way to do it. I generally prefer to do delay times in this regard, but you can do a fan uh, value for both fade and delay times, um, which brings into the topic of what's a delay time. So I want to set everything to one second. So I'm going to say time one enters. Now everything is going to take one second to transition. And the next thing we're going to talk about is what a delay time is. 
So a delay time, uh, there's also a way to access it from the programmer. So I can go to the delay tab and I can see those delay values. By default, it's always zero. Everything happens as soon as you send that command. Uh, so if I said uh, position time time, so if I say time twice, it knows that I'm going to specify a delay time. Uh, we'll say three enter, and it will say color time time eight enter. And this is very unpractical, but just for the sake of showing the example, uh, you can see how these times work. So I'll pick a new position, pick a new color, and we'll see nothing happens yet. Position just happened. Give it about a few more seconds and change our color. Okay, so you can specify a delay time. That's how it works. Uh, now, doing it sort of globally like that could be useful in a couple of situations, but where it's really cool is using it for um, uh, fanned values. So, what I'll do is I'll say um, time time zero. What that's going to do is just set everything back to a zero second delay, um, just so it doesn't bite me in the butt later. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say color time time zero through five enters. So that means that my first selected fixture is going to have a zero delay, so instantaneous, and my last fixture is going to wait five seconds. So now if I change colors, now I've got probably a better looking crossfade. All the fixtures are crossfading over the same amount of time. It's just when that start of the crossfade is actually um, changing there. You can also do multiple points on this. So if I said uh, time, time, uh, five through zero through five enter. If you look in the programmer, the first fixture has a uh, value of five, the middle fixture has a value of zero, and the last fixture has a value of five as well. So this is good if you want to do like those inside out type things. So if I click here, you'll see that my middle fixture going to the next two, next two, next two uh, has applied in that delayed order. And what's nice about this is this all gets recorded into your queue. So if you record it into a queue or a scene, you can uh, take a look at it. Uh, if you want to see what uh, happened again, you can uncheck blind. Uh, if you so, I just put on blind. You'll see that it actually does go out using those fade changes. And if I uncheck blind, I'll see what my queue will look like essentially. So there you go. My lights are already white. So now they are delayed in. That's kind of what my queue will most likely look like. Keep in mind that if you had other values at a different start point from a previous queue they will be uh, a little different, but you can kind of see that by double tapping blind. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So how do you actually store that as a time palette? So uh, the, if you want to record this information as a palette, you can use this to your advantage as well. So I'm going to press clear, just get rid of all the information. Let's say one through nine at full. And then I'm also going to do what's called touch. And the reason I'm going to do touch, and we're going to talk about this in a bit of a future video, but it's just going to grab all values for the fixture. So position, uh, intensity, color, beam, go low, all that good stuff is added into my programmer. Uh, and if I look at my fade values, my fade values are currently two seconds. I'm going to change that to zero. So once again, time, zero, enter. And then I'm going to hit record. And then uh, I'm going to specify using my kind mask, I'm going to say uh, time, and I'm going to choose a time or choose a location in my position directory. So I'll put it here at position 71. And I'll do the same thing again. I'm going to say time two enters, so and I have a two second fade. And I'll do it the other way, like what Megan mentioned earlier. I'm going to say time record. So now it automatically assumes that I only want time values. I'll put that into 72. And I'll say time five, enter. Uh, time record, 73. We'll say time eight enter, so a fade of eight seconds. We'll say time record and put it into 74. And now I can use these time palettes to kind of adjust how I'm making these changes. So I'm going to press uh, clear here. And we'll say one through nine at full. It took eight seconds to fade out because that's the uh, fade time. And then I'll say a zero second fade time again. I know it's not labeled, but it is a zero second time. And I can choose a new position and it snaps. And now I could do say my five second fade time and choose a new position and now it takes five seconds. So I could very quickly use these things uh, in my uh, tool chest here to uh, get things to happen with a little more grace than, than just being so instantaneous. Uh, so this is just kind of one way of punch a show. If you've only got like 30 minutes to throw something together, you know, record a couple of palettes, record a couple of colors, record a couple of time palettes, and just 
have at it. You know, maybe get a few things on faders if you have time. Uh, but if you don't have a whole lot of time for a show and just need to get something going, time palettes can be your friend. Um, once again, you can do the same thing for delay palettes. So if I said um, time time five through zero through five, enter, uh, say time record, put it into this palette here. And oops, I'm realizing you guys can't see my capture. There you go. Uh, once again, if I, uh, I use this palette, I pick a new color, uh, and then I choose that time value. Oops. Did I include white? I did not. Uh, so pick a color. Yeah, what did I do wrong? Through zero through five. I pressed it. Make the matter full. There we go. So I just pressed clear. I must have had something wrong in my syntax. Uh, so once again, I applied that palette. And now any changes that I make are going to go from the inside out because I've recorded that as a palette, a time palette. Once again, you can also use that. Uh, you don't have to use it in this regard of using it in your programmer, but you can use it to, uh, you know, get something specific that you need for your cues. Uh, so, like if I have a psych, a lot of times I'll do a left to right or an inside out or you know up down uh, transition, and I'll save that as a palette so that anytime that the director wants, uh, you know, I want to go from red to green or blue to white or from this color to that color, I already have that palette. I don't have to type in the values that I want. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna. Uh, have a Q&A here uh, for a little while. So if you have any more questions uh, about what we talked about today, we'll try to answer them. Uh, once again, we're doing a swag box. So if you uh, ask a question, uh, you'll get randomly selected and we will get your contact info and we'll send you a swag box. So if you have any questions, go ahead and send them my way and we'll try to answer them for you. Uh, if you're coming in late, the full video will be recorded to the uh, study hall YouTube page. So if you missed the first part, uh, you can go view it later. Give us a couple of days to get it up uploaded, but it will be there pretty soon. The first two webinars are already on the page. Um, Benjamin had a question. Can you record these time palettes into queues? Yes, anything that's in the programmer gets recorded into queues. That includes timing values. What's the difference between kind and command mode? In kind mode, it's used as kind buttons, so you can ch change up what's on your encoder wheels, just like with the fixed kind keys, with those button with those blank buttons to the right of the keypad. And in command mode, you can put different options there, so or different objects there, so like groups, palettes, um, lists, scenes, stuff like that. We are, I believe, that kind and command keys are that number t video number ten in the series right now. Yeah. That's what we're gonna where we're gonna focus and talk about all the secrets and shortcuts that we like to use those to, those for. Uh, I will say there's uh, one stream that's also coming up. Oh, they actually have a couple of guest streams coming up as well. Uh, so these streams are the streams that me and Megan are doing, but we are also doing some other guest speaker streams. Uh, so next week on I believe Friday we will have Mark Lorenz, who's sort of a famous uh, line designer, uh, and he'll be doing kind of a walkthrough of how he busks and punch shows. Uh, so some different topics from what we talked about today, um, get into some pretty advanced stuff. Uh, but if you're either way, if you're a, a basic programmer, you can definitely get some benefit out of it. Uh, so that'll be posted on the study hall page pretty soon as well. Cool. Um, there was one from a while back that asked, can, can I, how can I record a gobo rotate? or a three facet prism like without affecting the gobo uh, the easiest way to do that would be to to use that kind of masking option like we like we kind of went over so when you press record that um kind mask box is going to come up and ask what you want to record so whenever you have a my suggestion would be to have a custom kind with whatever you want in there so you don't have to knock anything out of the programmer um, but when you press record, it'll ask you, what do you want to record in there? Um, so then I would say, great, the prism or 
gobo rotate or whatever's inside that kind mask that I want specifically to record. So I'll show you just really quickly. So I'll put a gobo in. Uh, and it's currently it's rotating. Let's speed this up to faster value. So it's rotating here. Um, so just to kind of demonstrate what she uh, mentioned. Switch over the right monitor. You hit record. Uh, and I think, yeah, if you have, actually you have to make your own user account. It doesn't exist by default. Um, but what you can do is uh, in this programmer, you can just remove it manually. So uh, if you actually click here, you highlight those values for Gobo, you hit pig and backspace, it just removes it. Now it does still keep your rotation. So then you can record it into uh, your uh, beam palette and then it can be applied to anything on that wheel. What does punt mean? Uh, punt is a bit of a slang term. Uh, depends on kind of where you are in the world and what's, uh, but basically it's busking. Uh, so busking is just doing a show live, right? So, you know, you have shows that are queued where, you know, you basically just keep pressing go, and just kind of follow progression. Uh, and then you have shows that are just done live, right? The musicians or the performers are just going to do something uh, that you might know kind of what they're going to do, but you kind of don't know when they're going to trigger it. So that's just doing a show live, punting a show, also known as busking. Uh, I hear both terms kind of interchangeably here in the U.S. Robin just asked if a if I mix a color with CMY and store it as global, how does it replicate that in an RGB fixture? Does it turn everything in color into HS values? So this is how how Hog and I saw someone ask if we actually which one we prefer with HSI, CMY, RGB. Um, I prefer HSI, and so I never really deal with RGB values directly. But what Hog will do is invert those values to output correctly on RGB. Um, so, like, if you color mix cyan, it's going to take green and blue to 100% on those RGB fixtures. Um, so, Hog will just do that and only take into and will will do that conversion for you. Um, so, no, it doesn't turn color into hue and saturation values. You have to specify that, and you have to specify whether you're recording your parameters with CMY or HSI or with if you wanted to use RGB. Um, I'll use this as a tangent to say I like working in hue and saturation because the or CMY I prefer hue and saturation because of the color wheel and I can see where my fixtures are on the color wheel because when you have fixtures in a color and you pick a color then you get crosshairs so I can kind of visually see what color I'm going for at that point um and then for doing and then for see and so it just is a little bit easier whenever I'm programming Especially if maybe I'm not in the space and I don't have a visualizer hooked up with hog 4 PC, it's a bit easier for me to see where my colors are at that point. Um, and another reason why I like using HSI or CMY is because it applies to all my fixtures. Then, if my fixture is an RGB fixture, it should have, if it's built by a high end um, and it's not like a custom built fixture, it should have the CMY or hue sat values already or parameters already. So that means I can apply that to any fixture type. So I can I can color mix my LED bars and my UNOs at the same time. Whereas if I'm using the I red, I green, I blue, and I want to apply that color to my solo spots at the same time, I have to do I can't do it at the same time. I have to then color mix my spot 2000s at a different time than my LED bars. But that's why I prefer prefer not using RGB. Um, I don't know if Noah has different. I think Noah is pretty I similar agree, to me. I, I, me and you agree on this yeah. topic completely. I, I just prefer hue saturation, and that's just it. Really, it's how my brain works. Uh, I think it makes the most sense. I visually like the color picker because it does work in hue saturation. I like mm -hmm. it because I have. I actually prefer less points of control. I would prefer to just choose how deep of a color I want, which is saturation, and then where on the wheel I want it, which is hue. Uh, when I have to move three encoder wheels or move three sign magenta yellow values, uh, my brain thinks additively, not subtractively, uh, when it comes to color mixing. So, like, if it was red, green, blue, yeah, I could do it pretty easily, but for some reason, my brain does not like CMY. Uh, so, and, and that's just something that I see. Some people, they they really like that functionality, and, you know, it's great. 
Uh, I just, I prefer hue and saturation. I think it's just also easier to write effects in. It's also easier to fan in personally. Um, but you know, that's just, that's just me. About 95% of the programming I do would be hue and saturation. Not that I don't use CMY, but I, I certainly uh, do uh, under some certain circumstances. Now, if the designer is speaking to me all in CMY, I, I personally like programming. I don't like designing myself necessarily. Um, so if my designer, which he usually does speak in CMY versus hue and saturation, I will just listen to him. I know I know enough color theory to do that conversion if I need to, um, but then I'll do everything in CMY because if he, for some reason, calls in someone else to program for him and they're using my show file, then it makes sense for that programmer versus me doing whatever I want. Um, but I, I would prefer HSI. Um, John then did a follow up to me asking if that means that I patch all my fixtures in HSI mode. No, I still patch them in RGB mode. Um, because hog will just do that direct transfer some CMY to RGB. If the fixtures are in HSI mode, just getting into a little bit of how the color picker works in hog. If the fixtures are patched in H HSI mode, I still can't use my color picker. Um, I, th we need those it's different hue saturation value. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different, Simpler. it's a different parameter. It's just not the hue and saturation pa parameters inside that color kind. Um, so like it, with our, even in this show file, we have those source four lusters. Those are patched as RGB plus seven mode so that I can still use my color picker and then have direct access to my other seven LEDs if I need to, if my color picker is not getting it enough. Um, so no, I don't, I don't like using other modes besides RGB or CMY mode, whatever the fixture calls for. Yeah, if a fixture has a, a red, green, blue input mode, uh, like I said, the Lusters is a great example. It actually has multiple emitters, more than just red, green, blue. Uh, what's nice is you can put it in red, green, blue mode, and it can receive that red, green, blue signal, and they convert it to the seven point or five point, whichever type of fixture it might be, uh, at the fixture itself, which is what we both generally recommend. Mm -hmm. um, Noah, I'm going to take this question to you. Can time pellets be stored globally? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you want to try it real quick? I could actually be wrong. I might actually only be full fixture. One to nine, one at four. And the reason why I give it to you is because you're driving the console. Voice. I usually do a full fixture because most of my time pallets are just going to be fans. That's just how I roll. Um, and so let's take a look at what's in the programmer before I record. So we'll fade. Let's do a time of five enter. Or delay, we'll just keep the delay at zero. Let's test it. So I'll say um, let's also touch some pan and tilt values. So once again, my program, I've got uh, pan and tilt values, I have a fade value of five, a delay value of zero. Hit record, break time, put it into my directory. Oops, record global time, put it into my directory. And there it is. Yep, it is. It does get recorded globally. Cool. So yes, uh, you can store it globally. Yeah. So you do have to enable it. Cool. Uh, yeah. So you just have to actually specify whether you're doing it global, especially if you're doing it in the position directory or in the intensity directory. Um, I know, like, if I'm doing time only palettes, I like to do time only in like my intensity directory because I'm not using my intensity directory for anything else. So it's just a clean way, clean spot for me to put my intensity directory. Um, cool. Uh, uh, if, if I record colors with an LED fixture using I red, I green, I blue, is there any way to translate those colors to CMY? Noah, do you want to take this? Uh, yeah, sorry, let me read it a little better. So if I record colors with an LED fixture using I red, I blue, I green, is there a way to translate those colors to a CM CMY fixture? Uh, so yeah, they should they should translate. Uh, you basically, you should just uh, you know, select your fixtures. You might have to like re-record it, uh, but just you know, swap your parameters from red, green, blue to CMY. So that can be done in the programmer. Uh, so you have to reprogram the values. You can't. 
Yeah. So it's not a shortcut around it. I think it's what Bud's probably asking for a shortcut. Yeah, I, I generally do not recommend you work in um, bright green blue mode because the first thing is uh, it's uh, it's intensity parameter. So it does, uh, you have to hit record and it doesn't actually store into a color directory. Uh, so it's an intensity parameter. Um, there's some reasons for that. Uh, another thing is it's not always additive. So if I were to touch I read here, it doesn't actually add blue and green to the programmer. Uh, and it's just the behavior of how this specific parameter works. So what I do, you know, is if you have a palette or a queue that's already using those values, I would select your fixtures. Uh, so, you know, 413 at full, say they were told to get I read. Uh, open up that editor, open up that palette, that queue, whatever it is you're looking for, uh, and then apply a hue and saturation value that would push you to full. And then just update it there. That's kind of the uh, way to work with that. Um, Ooh, I think I found a good one. You have a good one? My favorite questions. One of my favorite questions. For it. it comes up all the time. Uh, this is off topic. It is actually very on topic. But is there a way for me to control the sensitivity of the wheels on Hog4 PC? Yes, so Hog4 PC by default is actually pretty sensitive on the encoder rules. So what I mean by that is that uh, if I said one through enter, go to intensity and you know, my intensity, these are pretty actually sensitive. Um, so if you want better, finer control, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, you can temporarily enable it by holding down uh, control. Uh, and that'll give you a finer mode. But you can also end your preferences. So close these windows here. Uh, we have an entire window for it. Preferences, sensitivity, turn down those uh, parameter wheel, as well as any of the other wheels that you might be using, like the trackball wheel that's built in there. Is an emulation of the trackball on the actual consoles. Uh, so yeah, you can turn all those down, apply your change, and it will be um, much, much more, uh, give you a higher range and not as sensitive. Okay, um, Chris, that syntax that you said Q1, fixture one through nine at zero, enter, record Q1, Q2, fixture one through nine at full, color two, enter, color time, time, point five, enter, record Q2, that should only delay your color. That should not delay the whole Q. Because you did color, time, time, 0 0.5, so only masking time to color. Yeah, and if it, and if it doesn't work, uh, you know, try it a different way. So maybe open up that queue and edit it, edit the values there directly. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll open up just some random queue here. Uh, I think actually one of these, which one of these is it? Not this one. This one. Yep. So this six U Q. There's actually some fan delay times in this one. This is just a audience blaster from center, uh, but you can actually enable the queue. So if you were in this window, you can hit view queue, hit edit. And then if you wanted to only uh, modify specific fixtures, uh, you can choose them. So like if I wanted to say, you know, just these four and do, you know, two enter update, it's gonna be really ugly. See that I've got fanned for some of the fixtures wasn't affected, but then the first four fixtures uh, did have that two second delay. So if it doesn't if it doesn't work in that regard, you could try uh, a different method later. It's probably just a simple syntax thing. Um, Gideon up here asked if you can reference time palettes. Yes, when you hit when you just like Noah showed when referencing any type of palette, it's a palette at the end of the day. It just has timing information instead of like position information. Um, a lot of these guys, if we're showing you one way to do something with like a palette, it works with all the palettes. It's just different information inside generally. Uh, Trevor asks, how do I undo, oops, scroll down. How do I undo auto kinds or palettes if needs to be changed? Way to keep scrolling on me. Sorry, that's. I think you're assigning them as complete, and I'm. Uh, yeah, I just live on the unanswered column. 
Okay, how do I auto, how do I undo auto kinds or palette if I need to change my patch and don't want to make duplicates when I hit that button again at a later point? Uh, so any of the auto generation of like auto kinds, it's not gonna, it shouldn't duplicate. Uh, but if you have stuff in your show file that you don't need, just delete them. Uh, what I would recommend is if you are going from like a show file to show file and different fixtures from different fixtures is uh, take the kinds that you do want and move them lower into the kinds directory. So like move them to like kind 51 to whatever, and then regenerate your auto kinds and then delete what you don't want from that auto generation then move back in whatever it is that you want to. Uh, I hope that answers your, your question. And if you add in fixtures, just to put a little bit more on this, if you add in fixtures that already belong to that kind, like you don't have to regenerate your auto kinds. So if I had my spot 2Ks and I then added in some spot 1000s, I wouldn't have to generate my auto kinds to get my color mixing again. Any fixture that has color mixing values will work with that kind. The kind is fixed, it's kind of fixture agnostic. It doesn't really care what fixtures, it just cares that the fixture has the parameter. So even if I have a quad, it'll still apply to, even if I had a quad in the show file at the beginning, five shows later, I now have a hex, it doesn't matter. It still has pan and tilt and CMY, if that makes sense. Uh, Lars asked a good question. Can you put fade timing on a fader? Uh, so maybe not so directly as just putting fade changes on a, on a fader, but you can do what's called a playback rate scaler. And what that does is that scales your uh, fade and your delay times. Uh, so on the fader, you can push the fader up and that would increase, or sorry, technically decrease it to make it faster, uh, those fade and delay times. Whereas if you push it down, it'll slow down or um, make longer fade and delay times. Uh, so we're going to get into that when we start talking about chases, which will be in the next video for playback. Uh, and then we're also going to get touch it again when we talk about batches. Uh, so batches allow you to control multiple playbacks at once. So you can control the playback rate or effect rate or effect size and multiple playbacks at once. And that's actually really a, a true busting tool uh, compared to saying using fade changes. Fade changes is great as a get you out of jail card. Uh, but as far as like actually doing a show on it, it can be useful. It can be done. I have done it myself. Uh, but really, you should focus on doing things at playback and then modifying it with, like I said earlier, that playback rate scaler, effect size and effect rate scalers can really be really handy. And something, probably the last tip I'm going to throw in, because we're running a little bit over our time here, um, is that you can change your global fade time. So if you go into setup preferences, um, instead of having like some people like to just apply the palette that changes your fade time to three seconds, if you notice you're doing that a lot, it's probably better to go into your preferences and go into timing and you can change what your fade and your delay time default is and you can do it on a per fixed kind key timing as well if you needed to. Um, so like if you wanted to have your fade time instead of two seconds always be like four seconds instead you can do that. And that way again it, it can possibly save you to either time while programming or also even save you by just turning on fade changes. Cool. Um, and if you guys have specific support questions, like, hey, I did this one time and it didn't work, or I want to check my syntax and see if it's valid, you can definitely shoot us an email at support at highend.com. That's a lot easier because my name is spelled weird um, than just trying to spell my, remember how to spell my name. Um, so just support at highend.com, and that'll actually get it to both of us, and we can respond to you no problem, uh, stuff like that. Again, here's a list of the upcoming streams. We really appreciate y'all coming and watching us again for the, is it, has it already been three? For the third week? Three, this is our third video, yeah. For the third week, uh, yeah. We, we have seven more, at, at least seven more plans between me and Megan. Uh, we're already talking about what we want to expand after this sort of series. We wanted to kind of do a linear, kind of from start to almost finish and just maybe skipping and touching a few things here and there between. Uh, so that's gonna be kind of me and Megan series, but we also have a couple of guest LDs and programmers that we're bringing on board to uh, have them do some guest streams as well. Uh, actually, Scott mm -hmm. Barnes, who's a famous uh, uh, movie LD programmer, uh, he actually did a live stream recently. He actually did it on Facebook and then we were able to take it and put it into 
our um, YouTube channel for the study hall. So if you want to kind of get some perspective on kind of how Hong is used in the TV or uh, film world, uh, that has already been posted. And so we have a uh, busking one coming up specifically on busking. Uh, that's going to be done by Mark Lorenz. Uh, and we've got a, hopefully a couple more coming in soon as well. Uh, and of course, there's also EOS videos and all kinds of other videos, not hog related, but ETC and high end related as well. So uh, if you guys have any questions, once again, support at highend.com is a great way to get in contact with us. You can also email us direct if you want, uh, but support at highend.com is usually the best way to get someone pretty quickly. And, make, and if you guys have any specific topics you want covered, like make sure you fill out that cert or have any feedback for us. Make sure you fill out that post watching survey because that really helps us, um, that, that really helps us like me and Noah go over the answers together actually after this, like after we get them and it helps us decide figure out what we need to work on for the next stream and stuff like that and if we need to add in other videos with different topics as well or add in topics to ones that we already have planned it um, helps our examples out for y'all yeah definitely cool and with, right. with that we're gonna okay. say thanks guys we'll Thank see y'all next week remember to wash your hands